that we can hear you. Let me turn up the Okay. Let me turn up the Okay, cool. All right, someone say hello again. Hello. Hello. Right. Good volume. Okay. All right. Dale, start the recording. We are ready to start. We're going. That's We're live. Essentially. We're live. Okay, and welcome to this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. We are live at Cranbrook Institute of Science. Um, it is the unfortunate duty of the president of organizations to have to inform the membership of the passing of a member, and we have to do that. Dr. Phil Martin passed last month, and um, this came kind of as a surprise to many of us, as there was there was no service or anything like that. So. Um, Ken Burton is going to give a short eulogy for Dr. Phil Martin, and then I'll be saying something if anybody wants to say anything afterwards. Ken, are you uh, ready? All right. This is a bit off the cuff, but uh, Phil Martin is one of the people that uh, uh, got me into the club, and many of us who have been here for a while also honor this brilliant fellow. Phil was a photographer supreme. He was wonderful with a telescope. He was a PhD um, and, uh, and was uh, one of the smartest people that I've ever met. He also had a wicked sense of humor and he could, uh, he could bring a smile to anyone at any time on any subject. And uh, I'm uh, just uh, up here telling you that uh, we lost a terrific person in our club and we should all be remember phil in our uh, in our thoughts and prayers all the time there was nobody like him and um he was always at the um, bill beer star party went time after time after time and um always had a hat on and she was quite a quite a fellow and um condolences are to his family um, and i hope uh that uh, we can aspire to be like phil in in a personal way to each of our friends and such so with that i'm if there anybody else that has another thought on him i know that there was i know that bill beers wanted to but he's out of town Got it. you want to say so something we can yeah just briefly um I believe we have someone, I think you have pictures of him. Uh, if we can get those pictures during break, that might be a good time to show them for the meeting since we didn't we didn't quite plan to show them during our um, eulogy. We can try and show them during break, but then we'll have to set up for our speaker. So, so that's something we'll look into as we get through the first part of our meeting. So uh, with that, Bob. I asked my wife, well, what do I say about Phil Martin? And she says, well, as I remember, he was one of the nicest people I ever met. And he talked to anybody about anything. And that's pretty much how I remember him. Uh, he was probably at my first meeting here. So I saw him sit right over there at many a meeting. We are encouraging uh, the membership to make a donation to St. Jude Children's Hospital. Uh, in memory of Phil, um, I believe there's a link in the WASP about that. He also worked with them for a long time. Oh, he did. He also worked with them for a long time. So remember Phil in your in your hearts and in your in your in your pocketbooks. We have uh, four WASP column calendars left at fifteen dollars a piece. We have uh, WASP glow in the dark bandanas at five dollars a piece, and lapel pins four dollars each, two for seven, and three for ten. You can get those at the break. So, um, continuing on with the meeting, um, if anybody is interested in housing our library of old astronomy books, uh, we we would desperately like to get rid of, or Diane and Jonathan would desperately like to get rid of them. Marty, the old astronomy. Yes. Books? Yeah, I can do that. Wow, awesome. Thank you, Marty. We're around a round of applause for Marty. Thank you. Ooh. Wow, thanks. That, that's been a thorn in our side for a long time. 
Okay, April is Global Astronomy Month. This is where everyone is encouraged to promote astronomy the way, any way they can. Workshops, astro art, social media posts, observational programs, whatever. We kind of do that anyway, but hey, so we're just encouraging everyone to do it. Um, are there any first timers here? You're all the members. All right, well, uh, you, you can renew your memberships at the break with Adrian or by PayPal on our website. Um, we have a volunteer to do AV. Yay! Thank you. You can come up with whatever title she wants, AV czar, master, what have you. That would be awesome. But, um, okay, um, black meetings uh, every second Thursday of the month. Actually, oh, they moved that to the third Monday now. You got to fix that. Um, so if you're interested in astronomy at the beach and you like it, we, we would like, they they need your help. And uh, we'd like to see more WASP representation during those meetings. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm going to give David Levy the floor, get you out early in case you have to leave early. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dale. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to be here. And my quotation for this meeting is actually from Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. And uh, he's talking about a Jacob staff. And um, there is a scientific instrument that was invented by Gersonides in the 14th century. He was a rabbi from France. And he invented what I would call the 14th century Webb Space Telescope. It consisted of two of, of a stick and a uh, and a right angle stick, and you were able to use it to measure distances between stars in the night sky or between a star and the horizon at a particular time. And uh, scientifically, there's no real evidence that the Jacob staff was uh, named for the patriarch. But when I read the play, uh, the play, the footnotes referred to both Genesis, which refers directly to um to Jacob the patriarch and in the New Testament uh Hebrews where it refers again to that the quotation is as follows from Shylock by Jacob's staff I swear I have no mind of feasting forth tonight but I will go go ye before me Sarah say I will come and that's my quotation for tonight I'm really glad to be here and back to you both all righty. Thank you, David. Okay, for author's reports, um, in my and in, in I wrote a field of view article, kind of on a spur of the moment, and it's in the, it's in a newsletter. And in in that article, I uh, proclaim astonishment at the announcement of volcanoes on Venus, uh, the number of them. Others uh, on Twitter, if they'd be willing to give a talk to us. And one of them liked my my question response, but has not responded. I imagine they're getting hammered with media requests, but I, I found that article fascinating. And, and in part of my job, I sent a query to my NASA solar system ambassador rep, and I got the reply. Uh, there's still a person at JPL that worked on the Venus Magellan mission. He was the technical engineer who sent the last message to the spacecraft, the one that caused Magellan to plunge into Venus's atmosphere and burn up. His name is Dave Doody, spelled D-O-O-D-Y. Now, when messages are sent to a spacecraft, it automatically sends a response back to Earth, contains the original message. I didn't know that, actually. That way, the engineers know that it got there and see if there's any glitches. However, when Dave Doody got his response, it read, I'm sorry, Dave, I'm afraid I can't do that. So I just thought that was really hilarious. It was some epic programmer snark. So uh, first VP, uh, Dale Parton, give you a report. Well, I just want to say uh, we are booked with three speakers every month up through September. If you have, which I'm glad of, uh, but if someone here has something they'd like to present, either a full length presentation or a short one, uh, we'd be looking at October or later. Uh, please see me at the break. I'd be glad to hear from you. Thank you. 
I'm telling you, I'm getting real itchy to do something on Magellan, Dale. So this, this, this finding all this information in 30 year old data is really interesting. So our second VP, uh, Jeff McLeod, will be talking about our, our awesome observatory. All right, I got a, I got a lot of stuff to cover today. So March wasn't great. Fortunately, nobody remembers me promising clear skies. So you good. Did you do that? Uh, yeah, and I'm going to do it again. Watch me. Uh, it was actually better than it is right now. So uh, April is scheduled for the 22nd. It coincides with a peak of the Lyrid meteor shower. So we might get a little bit more attention at this open house. So clear skies, promise, guarantee. Me to you. Clear skies or somewhere. Remember these words. Okay. Uh, aside from that, uh, what's going on at the observatory? We just got an approval for some big DOB upgrades. I won't bore you with the details, but the DOB's going to get a little bit easier to assemble and use in the near future. Uh, we've got some other stuff, little knit-knacky things for the observatory. Observatory. Uh, the big thing is we're trying to revitalize the Stargate committee. Uh, if you're not familiar, there is a subgroup, the Stargate committee. These are the people that I reach out to when I need help. Uh, different volunteers, hey, I can't make the open house. Uh, it consists of kind of all of the previous uh, observatory chairs. So if you are interested in getting more involved, you get to use these amazing telescopes that we have. The K2 under the dome, the big dob. They're, they're yours to play with. If you want to have a members only night, this is something that we tried to do in the past and never got off the ground. Uh, so we also need people to help run the DOB at Astronomy at the Beach. I know it's a long way away, but we got to start now. We need people that know how to use this equipment. We're getting kind of stretched thin with who can actually run the observatory. So see me, get involved. It is a lot of fun. It is the best thing to do out at Stargate. Uh, aside from that, I'm also the discu uh, discussion group coordinator. We had an amazing discussion group this month hosted by Laura Wade. Give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. Yes, it was well attended. We all had a good time. I don't know where you guys were, but you weren't having a good time. Okay. Uh, I've got one scheduled for April. It's the 25th. It's going to be in Rochester. It is specific for astrophotography at any skill level. You are encouraged to bring a thumb drive with your images so we can talk and critique these things. Details are in the WASP. Aside from that, I've got May the 30th. We're in the Wayne State Planetarium. I got us in the door. It's going to be an interesting thing where we can kind of actually ask them, hey, would you do this with the planetarium? And they'll do it. Private planetarium show. Okay. Aside from that, I've got nothing. So if you'd like to host a discussion group, please see me. I'd also love someone to take that job away from me. So if you're interested in actually coordinating the discussion groups uh, for the coming year, also see me. Okay, I'm also the snack coordinator. Uh, <laughs> so we got snacks. Uh, these are our snacks. If I don't get a, a volunteer for more snacks, when these snacks are gone, snacks are gone. Okay, so please see me volunteer. Uh, I specifically need someone that's willing to take the dry goods tonight and bring them to Macomb later in the month. If I don't get someone, it's me. I'm not as happy. Okay, I won't be twisting arms though. Okay, the arm twisting is done. I'm not doing it. Okay, so if we don't get snack volunteers, we go hungry. All right, that's my piece. Uh, I will also be giving a planetarium show at Wayne State Friday, May 26th. So if you want to see me making bad astronomy jokes, that is the place to go. That is all I've got. All right. So we've got one more thing. I've got a little survey I'm going to pass out. It's about board positions and kind of just I want a temperature reading. It's completely anonymous. All I need is check marks. Okay. Okay, I'm going to pass this around. It's not scary. That's Jeff not being scary. All right, our treasurer, Adrian, and our astronomical league rep. All right, so first thing I want to do is say the treasury is still strong. We're still within $29,000 in the bank. A little more petty cash in our PayPal account. 
and we have real petty cash on hand of around 500 bucks which we'll be adding some of that to for buying snacks so um as far as cash that's fine now for the fun stuff astronomical league um every tuesday night there's a global is a global star party held um by the uh the explore scientific and its president scott roberts and, uh, features such dignitaries as dr david david levy and you sometimes will see other folks like david eicher uh senior editor for astronomy magazine you'll see all the dignitaries for the astronomical league like carol org or i org i think he pronounces his name org though president of the astronomical league and they do giveaways on this global star party every once in a while and about three or four hours later they'll have a few of us get on there amateur astronomers and talk about our images and drawings and you'll even see some folks from southern hemisphere show their live images so it's a great time it's every tuesday night and it usually kicks off at 6 p.m central which is 7 p.m our time eastern uh feel free to look up you can either look up the facebook page of explore scientific or you can go directly to explore scientific.com slash live and you'll see the tuesday show now they run shows scott tends to run shows there every day of the week or most days of the week so there are other programs there's astrophotography programs there's even a birding program called on the wing that i think um runs every once in a while so all things astro um the astronomical league is a part of that we have um with our membership um entries we've had a few people who have given the uh, 750 that it costs to become a member of the astronomical league which is additional to your dues and that membership will be good all the way through the end of june 2024 the uh calendar for the astronomical league starts at the end of june every year and goes to the end of june the following year so if you are interested in being a member of the astronomical league please see me um, either during break or after our meeting and i can tell you all about it if you are not already a member we can make you a member again it's an additional 750 and um there's a site i think alcon.org and i'll i'll follow up on that one where you can look up the website for the astronomical league or google astronomical league and you'll find it and um then you'll see the various big thing about astronomical league and this is a shout out to our observatory chair they have visual astronomy uh, awards um certifications that you can get so things like double stars things like just leave it in the landing got... for a while you can take okay. it out later to the side door we're listening to your conversation call in user two um so certifications for um uh, visual astronomy there I think there are a couple of astrophotography certifications now too Jeff but um most of them are visual Messier objects Herschel objects so if you want to up your visual astronomy game the Astronomical League is a great place to start and uh with that one other quick announcement for our new AV coordinators um if you all would stand so that the people online cannot see you but that's okay our new visual coordinators for the group um give me your name chalia and victor chalia and victor are going to help us with our hybrid meetings please give them hand for stepping up because yours truly fumbles it every single time it, it's just the way it's been so so if there's any questions about the treasury or your membership status, let me know. Um, and we'll seek to correct it. And, um, aside from that, membership is always quickest and easiest using electronic means like PayPal. And I can actually accept membership. Um, I can accept membership with my tablet that I brought um, and credit card. So we can figure out. I have a swipey thing. Cool. That's right. 
I'm not all actually photographers don't know stuff, but um, another one quick thing for the treasury, we are going to support the uh, buying of all of the uh, pieces that will be going out within the next couple of days. So I've taken up enough time for the meeting. Um, all right, Bob. Thanks, Adrian. All right, Secretary Mark Kezier, he's going to tell me that the minutes are in the wasp, aren't you? I did. Okay, there we go. Um, <laughs> outreach, Kevin. Just a couple of quick things. Um, at on the 29th of April, there's a statewide astronomy night at Belle Isle, and we'll we're we're looking for anybody who might want to bring a scope there to support that. Um, Jeff McLeod has done it before, and so is Adrian. So um, I'll. Do you want? Yeah, and if you want to um, just talk to me after, I'll get your name down. I'll send out an email about it too to the people who usually bring scopes. There's an event at Huron Meadows on the 21st, which is out near Brighton. And you'll just, uh, we'll send something out on that. Again, they wanted scopes for that. So, um, but we don't have a, a lot of details on that right now. Okay. Um, Kev, Ken, uh, Burton, and Adrian have been working with the Detroit Public Library. Adrian's doing the talk this month. And Adrian's done a talk at the um, Ann Arbor system on chasing dark skies. Um, and that's what I have right now. Thank you. Publications, Dale. Um, you're going to tell me that the WASP is up, aren't you? Our award-winning newsletter is on our website. I'm telling you the WASP is up. It's on site. And uh, for like the second year in a row, I have not been put in for a possible award with the Astronomical League. So my feelings aren't hurt, but... <laughs> oh, my goodness. We need to fix that. Yeah, maybe you can tell the Astronomical League chair to talk to some folks. Just to play. You're you're allowed to win multiple years, you know. I'm just you know just saying. <laughs> All right, going into special interest group, Solar Marty. How is the sun doing today? And if you want to take a look at the sun yourself, you can go to sdo.nasa.gov and see the sun now. Can't see it if you go outside. I'll tell you that. The sun has been quiet for about a week or so, but now it's starting to uh, pop out a, a fairly large sunspot group, which was really there or well developed yesterday, but now it's actually grown about five times. Yeah, so it's about half the size of Jupiter on the sun right now. So it's actually pretty good. Uh, lots of activity on the sun this year. The solar cycle seems to be better than last year at this point. In fact, last year was actually pretty bad, but the uh, the amount of sunspots and activity on the sun is definitely higher than it has been uh, from the last solar cycle. So we're expecting a pretty good peak, which should be sometime around the end of 2024. So we're still well into the beginning of the solar peak, and a lot of good, a lot of good flares. So a lot of good aurora that we should be seeing pretty soon. So uh, the sun's getting pretty active and, and definitely worth viewing. On a note with uh, with Jeff on the observatory, I'm working on attaching with uh, the the uh, the uh, observatory committee working on uh, getting the solar scope mounted to the uh, observatory telescope. So we should have some regular solar group meetings out there. I recommend getting a camera adapter for your cell phone. Not too expensive, but an eyepiece adapter. If you get one of those, you can put, uh, put your cell phone up to the eyepiece or up to the telescope and be able to photograph what the sun looks like this summer till hopefully we'll get it together. Uh, Bob Burt is going to mach machine the bracket. I happened to buy it at Swap Meet. Oh, uh, so going to donate that bracket. So we should get that solar scope mounted pretty soon. Certainly before that. Maybe, maybe just after the rain disappears. Thanks. Would it be worth ordering one that could just go with the observatory that we could pop it on there when someone comes with their cell phone during open houses? I see. So um, Adrian was asking if it would be worth uh, getting a cell phone adapter for the observatory so that people could use it. I don't know if there's one general one for all cell phones, maybe because everybody's lens in the back of the cell phone is in a different position. So we might have to get one just for your specific cell phones. <laughs> 
hammer has come down. Or it, wow. Or it might have to adjust every cell phone to get proper. We're talking about cell phone adapters for our telescope. All right. Um. Um. There's no double star stuff at uh, at uh, uh, Stargate last time. Um. Now, one of the things uh, uh, in a special interest group, are, uh, uh, I'm going to screw your name up. I'm sorry, Vishalia. Yeah. She was interested in reviving the computers and technology special interest group, and I'm all for that. that that's fine. I, I, I love computers myself. But it seems to me that a lot of you astrophotographers are using computers, and, and that's one application for it. Now, I've got one of those computer games I like playing and, and the computer apps, the astronomy apps I like showing. But if anybody's interested in, in, in talking with her about the uh, computers and technology SIG at the break, that, that'd be perfect. I'd be interested in seeing us form an education special interest group. One of the things I've always wanted to have at Astronomy at the Beach is a table where teachers could do stuff. And speaking of Astronomy at the Beach, I would absolutely love to see one of the kids has a cell phone. I would love to see like a QR code scavenger hunt or something dealing with cell phone if anybody has any ideas on that let me talk to me about it all right so um uh that was it for the special interest group um does anybody have any astronomy questions before we go into observing reports no no questions all right anybody have any observing reports what have you seen come on up Jeff, our, our 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 first VP is saying you want to take Asher photos at Stargate. That's fine. So no no observing. We don't have any observing. All right. Yeah. What do you got? Oh, uh, John's got one too. We'll get you after Adrian here, John. I know. Uh, just really quickly. Oh. Um. So really quickly, uh, when I look for places to image, I will often drive a couple hours or more out of the way. So this past Saturday, um, I decided to drive out west because there's a lighthouse called Little Sable Lighthouse, and it's approximately three hours from where I live. So I made the drive, I got out there, and uh, lo and behold, I found clear skies. And so I was not only able to set up and image, uh, Little Sable Lighthouse is here. So you got sand dunes and you, you got this wow. dark sky park and then you got like real dark skies up here in the UP, dark sky park. And you got where I've been imaging over here. So I drove clear out over here. We like, there's some lighthouses, Big Sable I think is south of it. Little Sable's this small lighthouse that's remotely um, operated like most lighthouses are. There's there's no keepers building. They raised it to the ground. All that's really there is a lighthouse, some sand dunes, and a tree, and then you have Lake Michigan. And uh, because it was clear, I was able to frame some shots around um, the lighthouse so because I know how to operate this computer. Uh, this will this will be quick. Um, Let's see if my login is still here. My login is still here. I was at a bowling event. That's the commissioner and that's the sideline reporter. But what's more important is this album, the images. Yeah, we're not sharing it at all. I'm gonna pull up the image first and then we're gonna share screen. Um, now we're gonna share screen. Let's go to WebEx. So those of you can see what I am sharing. I wonder if that'll work. Okay, can you all see that picture? Yes. Okay, so that is with a waxing gibbous moon casting light on the front of that lighthouse. And as you can see, we're, we're at the edge of nautical twilight heading into astronomical twilight that still glow from the sunset that was there that I had just missed but what I'm looking at with all these stars I'm not seeing Milky Way and I'm not surprised but what I'm looking at with all these stars is 
that would be an interesting possible place for um, some imaging later. The way it's going to look is this. That's a right. My house is blocking the right. Yes, it's a club. Well, kind of an arcing winter known weather. So you can imagine that image when there's no moon. That's because there's a lot of stars out there. That's the please. Initial astronomy helps you to know what's actually there, Jeff. Yeah. That's a uh, that's Taurus and the Hyades, Prime, Cancer. And um, over here, Gemini is way over there off the screen. This part, I'm not sure. I can't remember what the hell you follow. He said, Orion's right here. The Pleiades is right there. I'll believe it when I see it. Wow. You, you should be able to see that. If you can't see that, then you're, you're looking at too many single objects. You got to look at the whole picture. You see that? Okay. Do you see the Hyades? Do you see the Hyades? There's the Pleiades. It'll, well, that, would be Taurus. that would be Taurus. That would be the shield of Orion. That would be Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, and all the good stuff has been blocked. Yep, over here, Canis. That is uh, Sirius. That is Procyon right here. That is Pollux. You gotta be kidding. Okay, to the this that's serious. This one that's pro. Okay, I believe you. That is pro C. And that's Pollux and Castor is off screen. Yep. Right here. That's the winter circle. Yep. Yeah, that was the whole point of the uh exercise was to capture the winter circle over the lighthouse. There was a stiff wind coming in and a lot of heavy waves. That's why the long exposure has ripples like that. Um, beautiful place to visit, beautiful place to stargaze. So if you western side of our state, this is one of many different places bordering the water to go and observe. If you have a small telescope, go take it. I recommend doing it. Um, I recommend doing it on dark of the moon though. There's Orion. Now we can see all of Orion here because I took the picture from this angle and then I kept going the other way. There's the moon right here. Over the, this is me standing with my back to the water and I have no idea. Yeah, north, that's the lighthouse. This is dusk and north is to the right of where we're looking right now if you turn to your right you are looking north if you turn to your yes you yeah you go left you go left along the beach i'll show you where you got to go so this is actually still facing kind of east here on the beach so go and then I'll turn it around. So go here, go to this, there's a little bitty, there's a hill here that you can use. Um, so if there's a big dune, go over here and face back towards that lighthouse, you will be looking north. And if what you say is true, that means you'll get Aurora over the water and you'll have the lighthouse there. So dark of the moon, that'll be one shot that I'll probably try in your honor. All right, that's enough sharing of the screen. That is my observing report. Yes. Um, I don't know if they allow camping at that particular location. Seems there's camping somewhere. I, I, there is an office that you, when you enter the park, there is an office somewhere. I don't know if there's camping. I would have to actually look up the uh, park, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was like further down. I don't know that you could camp right. Yeah, I don't know that you could camp like right under the lighthouse. Uh, that's something I would do, but yeah. Yeah, it's, and there may be, there's some, I know there's residential built places there and then there's, there may be some lodging, but 
don't know enough of the area. As soon as I got to the lighthouse, I just went straight for it. So that's enough talking for me, John. I think you have an observing report. Um, and so does Ken. So for uh, observing, uh, I uh, run an astronomy club here at Fox Run, a senior community that I live in, and um, I have uh, shown people how to recognize Venus and Mars naked eye that are easy to find in the sky. Uh, I did not recommend that they go out and look for the supposed five planets all in a line a few days ago, but unfortunately several of them read in the various newspapers or uh, websites that one could see five planets and they, of course, were all severely disappointed um, because Mercury and Jupiter were too low to be seen with all the trees and buildings we have around here. And Uranus, of course, can't be seen without a telescope, especially in city light pollution. So they saw the same old two planets I've been telling them all the other days and were severely disappointed. Uh, I also have an astronomy question. Um, on Jupiter, there's these bands and zones and the uh, winds blow in opposite directions every other band and zone. So um, this probably has something to do with the Coriolis effect where here on Earth we have some places where wind comes from the east and some from the west, but the ones here on Earth are occupying most of the planet in each direction, you know, real wide band. So why on Jupiter are all these numerous narrow bands alternating, some flowing east to west and some going west to east? Anybody have an answer? I don't. The Jupiter's cloud bands, why are they flowing in opposite directions like that? Ken says it's a huge magnetic field. Magnetic fields affect clouds? That's odd. Uh, they aren't magnetic. Michael Dowd is saying it has something to do with the Coriolis effect. Well, John, I'll find out for you. I will find the answer for you. But I, I thought so, it had something to do with Io, as a matter of fact, but I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, we, we'll so your answer, it, it's, it, it, the, the, the different directions of various latitudes results from different atmospheric pressures. So why are they uh, alternating? You know, there's numerous clouds, bands, and zones, and every other one is going north, south, east, west, and west, east, and east, west, west, east. Seems like the pressure would make them all get swirled together and mix up. I don't know. I said I will find the answer for you. I will, I will find yeah. the answer one, for you. One of the one of the questions you can't really relate directly to the Earth's atmosphere, even though it has directional changes too is the fact that Jupiter is so much larger. So mm -hmm. if the effects there could be localized in a broad band, if you will. But I don't have any other information to share on that. Thanks. Okay, so uh, any other observing reports? Yes, I do. Go ahead. Uh, I've been away for a couple of months, so I thought maybe I'd share a little snippet of what I've worked on recently. Can you see that? Telescopes. Okay, so what I wanted to do is, um, so I'm the, I am quote, the proprietor of the Northern Cross Observatory. I just wanted to show you the three different setups that I use to do imaging. The one on the, the left is for my uh, galaxy work. And that's my Richie Cradian, 10 inch Richie Cradian. The one in the middle is for my wider field work, which is a four inch F7 refractor. And then the one on the right is my six inch SCT I use for solar work. So that's what those are. The what I'm going to show you now is lately I've been using this four inch uh, refractor and also this 300 millimeter lens to do some wider field imaging work. And just recently we had uh, the asteroid series go by M100 and I caught it after it already passed because of cloud cover. But I did catch it and it took this um, time time lapse basically of its motion relative to the rest of the sky. So this is M100, and there's a bunch of other galaxies in here, but this is the uh, uh, series, the uh, largest asteroid that we, we know about, and I will uh, maximize this here. 
Um, this is all the galaxies that are also in that field of view um, that I took. And again, this is a series at just under seventh magnitude. And then um, this is through a 300 millimeter, the uh, Mercurians chain in the, the Virgo cluster. And, uh, you know, M84, M86, et cetera. There's lots of different galaxies here as identified uh, right here. This is just the NGC catalog that's displayed here. I didn't even bother with the PGC because you wouldn't be able to see any stars with there's so many in there. So that's my report for just this last week or so. All righty, Ken. Uh oh, Ken. We're tag team observing reports here. I'm trying to get. I do want to mention one thing though uh, about uh, uh, the uh, the most interesting thing I saw in the news recently on astronomy was where they made a big fuss about the planets lining up. Now I got to tell you, I got a chuckle out of that because planets are on the ecliptic and they all line up all the time, and <laughs> and uh, they weren't particularly close to one another either. Uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, the, what the Adrian's kind of put up here is the uh, picture of uh, uh, Jupiter and Venus, which I don't know how many of you saw that, the real close thing. People we were saying, look, there's a car in the sky, you know, because it looked like two lights were going to come at them. So uh, I've kind of been explaining to people that uh, a lineup is like that. Actually, there was something very interesting in that lineup that uh, Saturn and um, and Mercury were close for a while, but they were a little bit low on the horizon. As a matter of fact, I think they were on somebody else's horizon, not ours. Um, so uh, can you think you can get that in there? This is really kind of cool. I was went outside and just looked out and took my five phone up. So the, the photos are not showing up, but I can do this. Yeah, what I'm trying to do is show, get the photos to go somewhere where you can see them. Okay, here, so it's it's a picture of a house and there's two bright dots. Anyone want to guess who those dots are? Okay. Maybe, um, can you get it? Let's get into the camera, All right? Uh, the, the interesting thing about this particular, um, this particular uh, shot can you see can people see yeah there it is okay and that, that that's i'm going to center the actual dots um, right over the there yeah. they're they were right together and and uh and okay. the interesting thing about them is they were both you know uh within about what is it, about four hundred and eighty thousand uh four hundred and eighty million miles of us and uh, Venus can get to close to 26 million. And at this time, both of them were on the other side of the sun. So uh, Jupiter was sitting at about 550 million miles away and Venus was actually sitting about 127 million miles away. Um, and uh, obviously they were not at their brightest at that point in time being on the other side of the sun. Okay. But it was kind of cool. Yes. And um, okay picture yeah he has another really good one there too yeah there we go there we go there it is so oh, you can and see now you and guys course, can't see it but you will very soon i'm going to share it um okay so that that's the stylized photo that i took so that's the, the day that's before okay. for those who are here yep so that was the day before they became a pair of eyes. Right. So that's what I, I had that November. Day. No, is it? Uh, it was just another month, month ago. Yes, maybe I'll. I could actually see look at there's some info about. But this. again, it was uh, it was stunning to look at. March first. March first. That was white. So mine was like the third or the December. Oh, you were earlier. Yeah, I was a little earlier, so it would have been uh february 28th or something so they were still only separated each of them by about uh uh 400 million miles <laughs> it's also close. what's that march 1st would have been the closest march 1st. And, okay uh, and well, march maybe... 2nd was good too but march 2nd we had uh it's like the the mars uh the mars uh being uh, occulted by the moon 
the clouds in Michigan, a cult of the moon. So that took care of that picture. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anybody else have any observing reports? Good. All right, Ken, we got to go. We got okay. If not, then we're going to take our break and we are going to reconvene. Let's see, it's 8 15. Actually, it's time for our short presentation right now. Um, Dale? What timing? It's exactly here. Let's get the Okay, um, our short presentation is going to be given by Bob Berta tonight. He's been a member of this August uh, organization since 2004. He served as secretary, second vice president, president, and outreach chair. And he's a member of the Oakland Astronomy Club, the Seven Ponds Astronomy Club, and even the San Francisco Astronomy Club out in California. Um, he's also a solar system ambassador. Uh, he designed the Astronomy Observatory uh, at the DBAR A Scout Camp nearby and as the manager of that observatory. As part of his scout duties, I mean, a man of many talents here. He is the Merit Badge Counselor for Astronomy, Cycling, and Fly Fishing. Uh, and I recall uh, that Bob uh, also worked as a safety engineer, this is kind of relevant to what he's going to be talking about, for an electric power company in California back in the day. Uh, his topic tonight, how to enjoy the hobby of astronomy without injuring yourself or others. Bob? Is there a uh, HDMI? HDMI cable? Which one are they use? Okay, are you connected to the... Uh, really uh, use HDMI if I could. Um, we can hook you to that, but are you on WebEx? Uh, no. Okay, join WebEx if you can. All right, I could do that. Yep, so stand by while we uh, join Bob's laptop to WebEx so that you all be able to see his presentation. Okay. Should be there. Wow, I guess we're ready. Okay. Settings, settings. Once you just Turn on location services. You can have in here. Cancel that. Please sign in through your court website again. Probably. Okay. Yeah, John. Yeah. Uh, do you have the email for that? Not sure if I do or not. I probably do. I don't necessarily have to. So I can use just verbal. Without options, it takes up time getting on. It's just yeah, it scans. Okay. Yeah, I see so, the HDMI. So what we'll do is we'll have you. Talk through the presentation. You got the HDMI connection. Maybe we'll hook it up during okay. the break or something. Yeah, we gotta clear that out. Okay. okay. Yeah, we. Okay. You've got to give him the. Go ahead and give Bob. Yeah. Hearing so that mm -hmm. he's got a hearing mm -hmm. or a mic attached. So yeah, he can hear. Okay. Very long. So are you guys worried about this? Feel the main business. So it's scary. Yeah, okay. Yeah, can you hear it now? Yeah. Okay. What you going to do is just get the talk. See the pictures. Well, pictures won't be a really big. That was it's just points. It's not really something that's really that dramatic. Pictures, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, as he mentioned, uh, yeah, I worked for originally I was an electrical engineer from Kennedy Tenor Construction Superintendent. And then later I was in the law department as the director of the CPL and claims part of the law for that company. And so I've always had a strong interest in the safety parts of anything we do um, in astronomy, especially because I think there's a lot of things that can really do you in and also hurt our clients, you might say, the public that we present to. Um, so you can hold your pictures up to the camera screen. That would be a good way to share. Pardon? Them. Up the camera? Yeah, just hold them up to the camera. Okay, I can do that. Uh, let's see, now, where are we? Where is the camera? Is it here? That's the yeah. camera right there. So. Hey, I got to show on there. Whoa. No, not really. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, there is. yeah, yeah it's, it's not worth it. <laughs> yeah, probably not. I'm mean, just now. Yeah. yeah. yeah probably. Okay. It's, they're mostly just little simple cartoons and everything. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, what I want to cover a few things about um, keep maintaining your health but also the health of our um, our customers, the public that we present to at our uh, open houses and star parties, et cetera, and also the legal ramifications of that. Um, we have, um, uh, one thing we also should pay attention to is, you know, your equipment, of course, make sure your equipment is safe to be around, and I'll cover parts of that and also your clothing. Uh, so let's talk about the health first, okay? Um, one of the main things that we're subjected to, you might say, doing astronomy is um, impaired vision. And by that, I mean the dark night sky, which means you're going to be more apt to trip or fall in your excitement to look through a telescope. So you have to watch your steps, obviously. Um, but also uh, look out for the equipment because a lot of equipment, not just yours, but your fellow amateur astronomers, it's going to be laid out there and they spend a lot of time getting their equipment set up, getting it polar lines and everything else. And if you all of a sudden run over there and bang into it, you're going to get up, people upset. But that won't hurt as much as the physical hurt of running into a heavy piece of equipment. Like the uh, uh, my telescope, some of my telescopes have a very heavy uh, counterweight on them and you don't want to run into that middle of the night with your head. You could give yourself some stars. You don't want to see those types of stars. Um, also, your health can be an issue in astronomy. Uh, we all know about things like uh, mosquitoes. You want to avoid those. There are some diseases they carry, miscomfort, et cetera. But also, uh, a lot of us like to kind of get down the ground to look through your telescope at an awkward angle. Well, be careful what you get into by kneeling on the ground. Uh, some of you know I had an episode uh, when I was working at our club's observatory where I was down on the ground working on some work in the restoration of that, and a uh, brown recluse spider decided to visit my leg. So that was not very nice. I ended up with a leg about twice as large as its normal size. And I had to go through a whole bunch of um, antibiotic injections and everything to kill me of that. So uh, think about things you can prevent mosquito bites and tick. Unfortunately, we do have ticks um, around Michigan up at our observatory. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever had any tick problems up there, but all the forest area around the observatory is full of ticks during the summer. Um, so there are things you can spray on your clothing, not your skin, but on your clothing to prevent ticks from getting onto your clothing. Um, I won't go any particular brands, uh, but there are ones you can go to any uh, Google, whatever to ask about, uh, what that they recommend for that. Um, there are also things you can get for preventing uh, mos mosquitoes, uh, which are non-chemical. There are devices that you can uh, uh, put on your belt and put out a, a fume, you might say, which is uh, noxious, noxious to the mosquitoes so they won't bite you. Um, and then finally, your clothing. Uh, if you're out at night, you probably should have some, I recommend longer pants. Don't try to run around in shorts, uh, maybe long sleeve shirts. Uh, you can also, uh, if you get a lot of mosquito out, you can also get a little net you can put over your, your uh, hat and hang over your face. That gets to be pretty hardcore, but 
there's been a few places I've gone to where you actually need to do that to keep from becoming mosquito bait. Um, so let's continue on a couple other things. Um, this is the nighttime dangers of astronomy. I talked about the bugs, uh, the weather, of course, being uh, hot or cold uh, during the nighttime. Um, usually we don't have to deal too much with hot, but we do have to deal with cold, especially the month we just passed. It's very easy to um, get yourself exposed to frostbite, et cetera. Um, I was doing a astronomy uh, presentation at the Oakland Astronomy Club. One night it was very cold out um, and I was using my tablet and to work a tablet, you use your fingers right on the out in the open. It gets pretty cold. I've since found there are a couple of companies that make them. I got one. Uh, it's a glove you can put on that actually allows you to have contact and actually operate your tablet. Uh, so those are actually a blessing. I've already used it a couple of times in the cold weather and they really work well. Not as good as keeping your fingers warm with a really thick, warm glove, but it does allow you to keep a little bit warmer and allows you to operate you know, with uh, your tablets or your cell phone to operate. Um, okay, I talked about trips and falls. Uh, this goes for not just uh, yourself falling down, hurting yourself, uh, and also for falling over your equipment that's out there, either yours or your neighbors, but you might want to consider how to prevent that from happening. Uh, one thing that I use, uh, and actually I think I was the one that first came up with this, when I was working for my power company, uh, from a safety standpoint, they had a material which is that you would expose to the sun or a bright light for you know two or three minutes, and it would then glow in a light green for about five to seven hours. So our club bought a couple rolls of that, and I think we still have it on the floor. The person that has the material still has a roll of that. But you can take that, put it on the uh, legs of your tripod, things like your counterweight on your tripod, and that will help a lot in avoiding going, falling down, hitting your head on the counterweights, et cetera, and also preventing the uh, our customers, the public, from falling into hurting themselves. Um, another thing we talk about in falls is falling at heights. I said, we mean falling at heights. Well, one of our favorite telescopes is our big dog. And what do we have to get up to look through the eyepiece of our big dog? A ladder, right? And it's easy in the middle of the night to lose your spatial relationship and start falling down. So most of us have figured out how to hang on to get used to it and everything, but the public doesn't normally have that exposure. So whenever we, we're using the big dog, if you may have noted, one of our safety things we always practice is to make certain they have hands on our ladder um, and you kind of be near them. So if they start kind of swaying the wrong way, you can grab them and push them back so they don't fall down. I mentioned early on about liability, and that is one of the things that we have some issues uh, we have to really be careful with. Because um, when we put on a star party, we do have insurance, but that's based on having protection for our members based on reasonable safety precautions. If the person, us, is not practicing good safety precautions, you know, things like letting him use a telescope during the day to look at the sun, which is really dumb and dangerous, uh, we can be exposed to a lot of uh, liability issues. So we have to pay attention to those type of things. Um, another one I want to talk about, unfortunately, um, yes, he left. <laughs> um, uh, David uh, probably could tell you some pretty nasty story about his best friend. Um, I can tell you a story about a good friend of mine I'm originally from California in San Francisco, and our one of our favorite observing spots close to San Francisco is right across the Golden Gate Bridge up on what's called Mount Tam. It's about 1,600 foot elevation right above the ocean, a great place to observe from. But getting there and getting back is up a very twisty road, okay? Well, one of our members' son was driving their astronomy van. They have a van which is used to present at schools and they have the astronomy decals on this side and everything else. Well, his son, after a late night, started dozing off, went over the side. Luckily, he went off and went up, up against the side of a tree which caught him because if it hadn't been for that, it would have been quite a fall down a cliff. So he was okay. The truck was a little worse for damage, but those of you know David Levy and his good buddy, Gene, that was what did him in. He evidently, as far as, somebody can fill in a little bit more information on this. Of course, Dave's not here 
to tell the story. But ah. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that was Gene and. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what happened? He was driving another country, which they had. Uh, he drove on a different side of the street than we do here. Uh, and this might have been maybe say Francis England or one of those countries that do drive on the wrong side of the road <laughs> for us Americans. And the other person was going also, and evidently one of them panicked and went the wrong lane and they into each other and of course he killed Gene. So, you know, there are dangers. Um, I used to, whenever I went on a nighttime um, imaging setup, I always made a point of not coming home directly. I always took a rest in my car. If I fell asleep, I'll just stay there sleep for a while because I didn't want to go on the highway at 3, 30, 4, 5 in the morning and all of a sudden doze off and next thing you got a big accident. Okay. driving here. Pardon? Rest areas are your friends. Yes, yes. Um, okay, I talked about, you know, the public, and I have a great cartoon that OSHA could have showed you. It was a uh, uh, Martian star party with all the Martians looking through the telescopes, and they have pictures of Earthlings on their shirt, as the aliens. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we talked about, you know, star parties. We talked about safety at heights. And one of my favorite things I like to do is solar observing and imaging. And that is something that has a very like uh, likelihood of causing a major injury or even blindness if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so only use approved only use approved solar equipment, solar telescopes. Uh, if you use those glasses that we have, the solar eclipse, you know, cheapo glasses, make sure they are approved. I know at the last eclipse, uh, there were a bunch of glasses being sold from Amazon, and they had to recall them all because they turned out they weren't, uh, I guess, ANSI standard or ANSI approved, and they would have been very dangerous to use. Uh, don't use alternative materials for observing. People have talked about using layers of film. Not a good idea. Just use solar appropriate material. More importantly, whenever you're doing a public star party with solar observing, do not walk away from your scope and do not let people look to your scope without first telling them all the safety things about that. Tell them, do not ever look at the telescope, even naked eye, uh, excuse me, look at the sun, even naked eye. Never, never look through any telescope, any binoculars, anything at the sun because you will be blinded almost instantly. It's very, very dangerous. Uh, your eye has no pain sensors in it, so by the time the damage is done, it's too late. So uh, one of the things we always tell everybody is make certain the first thing you do before using any solar equipment is test it. Each time you use it, make certain all the filters are appropriately held in place securely. They won't fall off. Make sure if you have a, a film filter that there's not pinholes in it. Uh, this is very, very important. Um, so again, this is the time of the solar cycle when we're going to be getting a lot of solar activity, a lot of interest in looking to our telescopes and viewing the sun by the public. Make certain you take the time to do it very safely, not just for yourself, but also for the public. So that's pretty much my talk. Any questions about that? Any personal observances? Think about the solar eclipse and the Hillary. Uh, Ken said, even for an annual eclipse, even though you think, well, it's an eclipse, but you cannot look, even though just a little bit of the sun is coming on the side there, that still will do the damage. So uh, annual eclipse, don't think you could take off your safety glass or your special solar viewing glasses. Uh, yes, when you get a full totality on a true solar eclipse, at that point, when it's fully covered, you can take off and look at it visually. That's okay. And Ken said, when you do that, the corona itself is no brighter than the full moon, so that's okay. 
But the minute you start seeing the sun uncovering, get those glasses or the protection back on. Okay. All right. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, the one thing I was mentioning to the uh, um, Metro Parks folks when I talked with them a couple months ago was the fact that at Astronomy at the Beach event, um, a woman tripped on the stairs because she couldn't see them in the dark. And one of the things that I saw at an astronomy event was somebody circled their telescope with a red LED rope, and that was very effective. You could see exactly where the stuff was and making pathways out of that. It's an interesting uh, an idea. All right, we're going to take a, a short break. Our feature presentation is going to be at 845, so we're going to have a short snack break. So take a bio break, uh, snack break, and reconvene in 10 minutes for our feature presentation. And, um, yeah, I do. Oh, I do. Oh, did you see it? You Two I don't know where she went. Oh, here she comes. Here she comes. I emailed her. I know. So she can log in. I have emails. She can log. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm here. 
Oh, sure. Hi. Hi. Can I help you with me? Yeah. Can you guys see my dress? I just got on the online, but I didn't dial into the meeting call. Okay. Good now. I didn't even know if I have the link. Okay. Good night. So it's just third. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's okay. It's out. Yeah. I want to get your floor. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Um, my college email likes to take the long, longest time when I want it specifically, you know, Murphy's Law and all. That's because they now they push everything to a digest. Oh, and I'm not going to get the digest until the morning. Okay. Can you can you go to the meetup website at least? What is that? Go ahead. Take care. You can try it. I could post the WebEx link in the chat. Oh, that's right. She's not on WebEx. Never mind. Right here. Until two years. We're getting there. We're getting there. My college now pushes all spam to something called a digest. So every morning I'll get a report on good and bad email that the digest thinks I shouldn't have. And that's probably where that link went. So I'll get it in the morning. You know, because the computer's smarter than I am. Any luck? Can I email? Can I email who's ever computer this is? Yeah. Or can I get on I have the email so I don't know. Oh, but you'll be email. Can I get onto Gmail from here? Yeah. On the Google Drive? Let me do that. Yes. Yeah, um I think it's give me a it's okay. If I just get in here, then I can get to my right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to get into Gmail, right? No, she do. Tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Very good. Are you a um, computer person? Oh, yeah. yeah. In your day job? Oh. So, are you having her join up to the meetup group? Yes. And then, okay. No, she's going to present it right now from here, but also I would let her join the meetup. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, give her yes. hosting rights through WebEx. Right. Yeah. Okay. But she's going to present it from like this. Her, her computer, yeah. Oh, from this one? Oh, okay. You can go either way. It's like if someone at home was presenting. Just sharing the whole thing. Science, I have no secrets. Why don't you rather present on your own computer? I would, but I'm telling you, the email that Dale just sent me got dumped into a digest, and I'll get it tomorrow morning. <laughs> Security. Well, that's because he has a bad track record there. He's considered hostile. <laughs> Just get one pen drive for the whole thing and copy all the presentations from them and present them all. I have to get it in that level. Yeah, I could have done that too. I had a hard drive. I'm done. Now I gotta just make my corrections here. Oh. 
Hi. Long time we'll see you. I see you, Rocky. He's so cool. He's making the president. Hey. Yeah. Let's put the shot here. Yeah. So my poor wife looks like she is going to be retiring. Not, not, her, not her because she wants to. It's a long, sad story about a, a, a incredibly poor management at her school. Children um, taking over the school and driving from her and her teachers out. So. But she was teaching astronomy for the last two years, and the kids loved it, and that's not so. But he loves astronomy. Okay. What? Is she's, is she's up? Um, your email got sent to my spam, which I which I won't talk about until the morning. When my comments start changing, puts it into a digest. It's an ancient digest to me to decide which one I want to keep or not. Right. So that's what happened to your email, which is why I am now well, doing it this way. And, Re-updating my slides. So you're on your laptop? Yep. Yeah. That works great. I mean, people have PowerPoint. It's great. Awesome. I'm very hard of hearing. Saying anything important. Well, what's going on? I'm watching something. I don't know. It's like a stream that's right now. Okay. So, you can either. Yeah, okay. Good morning. You got it. Stars of frustration. Thank you very much. Right. Not a very good clip. Adrian. It doesn't seem very different. Go when they eat seven block of the or something they have to write. Yeah. It may not afford it. Well, Donald Spoltz, I'm pretty sure he's up on the impact side of that, Tony. I gotta say, I'm gonna be sending us to the land you're this. It's not very fun. Yeah. What am I doing wrong? That's what I'm doing. Yeah. Very nice. Four. All right. All right. We're gonna get started here. Welcome back to this meeting of the Warren Astronomical Society. Uh, we are live at Cranbrook Institute of Science. We are having our feature presentation tonight. Our first VP, Dale Parton, will introduce first. Thank you, Bob. Well, tonight we are very privileged 
to have Dr. Nicole Zellner as our speaker. She um, teaches physics and astronomy at Albion College, Albion, Michigan. Her research interests focus on understanding the impact history of the Earth Moon system, which had a were involved in a sort of major impact once upon a time. They and the Earth, and though, and how those impacts affected the conditions for life on Earth. She also studies lunar impact glasses to interpret the bombardment history of the moon. And she teaches how the chemistry of simple molecules is affected by impacts. Uh, she's spoken to a whole lot of people, uh, a couple million, one way or another. Uh, and we're really privileged to have her here tonight. Um, her topic is starry eyes for chilly skies. Well, thank you, everyone. I am delighted to be here um, back at Cranbrook and also back with your group. Are we still broadcasting? Yeah, she's checking. Hi, everyone online. Um, well, let's give IT a hand, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just delighted to be back um, speaking uh, to you all. Uh, when you were in another in uh, place somewhere else long ago before COVID, um, I remember uh, speaking to you or at least interacting with many of you at multiple astro events um, around the state uh, uh, in the past several years. I've been in Michigan since 2005, uh, so it's been really delightful to be interacting with all the astronomy groups in this area. I just I, I adore all of you, and Astronomy at the Beach is one of my favorite events, so thank you for support doing the work that you do to support that. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, my time down in Chile. Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, about down there. Uh, which wildly was in 2018. I mean, some days it seems like just yesterday uh, that I joined up with a group of strangers and spent 10 days with them in a foreign country below the equator, which I had never done before, right? Uh, so being able to go below the equator and see the southern skies for the first time, including the large and small Magellanic clouds, was just almost a dream come true. But now some of you may know that I spent my first sabbatical in Australia in 2011, and I had big dreams of going to see the large and small Magellanic clouds in the southern sky from the outback. Um, and it rained the entire time I was there. So uh, it was the green, the green center rather than the red center, as it's called. They've never had so much rain. It was the rainiest um, in decades the week that I was there, of course. But boy, were those wildflowers beautiful. Uh, so I will talk to you about this program um, and being able to get down to Chile and up uh, and happy to answer any other questions. I'm a lunar scientist. Today was a big day for the moon. A uh, woman from Michigan is going to be on Artemis to Christina Cole, and that is just fantastic. Uh, very, very exciting. So I'm happy to answer questions about the Artemis program as well. Okay, so there we go. Uh, so the program that I applied to was called the um, Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program, or ASAP. And it started uh, back in 2013, uh, partially funded by the National Science Foundation and also partially funded by people who want to join along. And I thought this would be a great opportunity, again, because my, my viewing of the night sky in Australia was hampered by clouds. I biggest frustration is astronomers, right? Um, so I figured going to Chile and being able to um, get up high in the mountains um, of the Andes would be an amazing experience to be able to view uh, these, these southern skies. So I went with the um, fifth cohort, uh, which included nine astronomy educators from around the United States, including um, uh, Washington State, so the National Park Ranger Outreach um, 
um, Outreach Specialist of the Year was with us. We had um, a couple of Teachers of the Year from Oklahoma and Florida joining us. Uh, we had um, uh, amateur astronomers, a beauty, and you'll see some of their pictures um, a little bit later on uh, with us as well, um, as well as college professors. So Steve Case and I represented uh, colleges, at undergraduate institutions in the Midwest, and we were really excited to be with this group. Uh, the um, astronomers. Uh, Associated Universities Institute, AUI, sponsored the program as well, so we had a lot of their leadership along with us, and they're the ones who actually did a lot of the legwork connecting us with uh, the people at the telescopes in Chile to learn about uh, what they do and why they're there and why, why Chile in particular. So this is um, our group that I went with. I'm in the um, brown uh, turtleneck, kind of in the middle. Um, uh, Steve Case is off on the left-hand side. Kyle Jeter is right next to him. He was a Florida Teacher of the Year at um, um, uh, Marjorie Stillman School the year after the shooting there. Um, so that was quite special for him to be able to uh, do astronomy for his students from the Southern Hemisphere after the trauma that they experienced. Um, Tiffany, uh, Moira, Samara, Yasmin, I mean, so many people that um, we hung out together and got to be pretty good friends and we're still in communication and in touch with each other um, to this day. So uh, Chile, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is a long skinny country on the left coast, the left-hand side of South America. Um, it's roughly 3,000 miles long and very, very skinny. Santiago is this nation's capital right there with the Red Square. Um, and it turns out that there are hundreds of millions of US dollars invested in the astronomy infrastructure in particular in Chile. Um, in fact, by the end of this year once, or the end of next year, once the Vera Rubin telescope um, gets up and running, it will support 70% of the infrastructure of astronomy in the entire world. Um, and so I guess the question then becomes, why Chile? Why are we investing millions of U.S. taxpayer dollars in this foreign country? Well, it turns out that it's pretty much ideally situated to be an astronomical observatory uh, location. It has a really, really dry climate because the Andes Mountains um, are very high and because of the um, uh, controlled light pollution in the, in the nation. They have made it a national mandate for cities in Chile to control their lights. Wouldn't that all be wonderful all over the United States, right? Don't get me started on the LED street lights my neighborhood just put in. Um, and it, it has a very motivated gov government. They want to make astrotourism one of their big money makers uh, for the future, uh, foreseeable future. Uh, the Andes Mountains um, block the humid air from the rainforests to the to the east. Uh, of Brazil and Bolivia, and uh, they make for a very dry and stable climate, which makes for very dry and clear skies up at elevation. So as I said, it's roughly 3,000 miles along. So here's that, um, Bob, this is what you were looking at before. This is the country of Chile superimposed on the United States. You can see um, uh, very thin and very long, uh, but it, there's a lot of coastline there for us to work with. Um, again, here's kind of that viewpoint of um, the, the beach on the left-hand side and our view of the Andes on the right-hand side. And it's this combination of um, ocean current coming up from the southern polar ocean and up across the Pacific there, um, along with those Andes on the left-hand side that drive all that moisture away uh, from the mountains in the east or in the west and, and keep it away from the moisture in the rainforest on the east. Uh, it turns out that Chile is actually a really natural science laboratory. Yasmin Yatrico, uh, who came with us, was a high school physics teacher in Santiago. She was part of AUI, and she's been working now um, in the United States uh, as part of this whole program since 2018. Um, she has taken her students out both to the, the deserts as well as to the um, green space where there's lots and lots of, of wineries that make yummy wine, and um, even down to the um, southern coastal regions, uh, very close to Antarctica, uh, where they have penguins and other um, natural wildlife. So between the coasts and the, um, on, the, on, the, on the western side of the country 
and the deserts and the mountains on the eastern side of the country, you get pretty much the whole range of geography in the entire world in this very thin country that um, borders uh, South America. Uh, we had many, many um, uh, stops in our 10 days in Chile. We were basically doing a tour of the National Science Foundation observatories. So observatories that had been um, funded by the National Science, Science Foundation for professional astronomers in the United States. Um, we uh, all convened in Santiago, Chile, um, where we met up with uh, staff astronomers. Um, many of the observatories are headquartered right here in Santiago, uh, where uh, a lot of the headquarters um, uh, administrative staff uh, live and work and also where a lot of the data processing occurs. We spent the first couple of days actually learning about Chile um, and why Chile and learning about the different places that we were going to visit about the different um, the different um, astronomical observatories. And importantly, we were starting to learn about this very special um, situation where Chilean astronomers actually get guaranteed 10% time on these observatories. So when you're a professional astronomer, you're actually applying for time to use telescope time in order to observe your stars or your planets or your galaxies or whatever it is that you're interested in observing. You have to write a proposal and you have to justify why telescope time should be spent on your project. Um, and it's a very competitive, it's a very competitive process. Um, it's not only, you not only use it for uh, telescopes on the ground, but you also use that same pro proposal process for telescopes in space. So the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, um, was uh, the uh, premier telescope that people were using for space-based space observations. And it, interestingly, I think some of you will get um, be very interested in this, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope wanted to see whether or not uh, female uh, astronomers were being disadvantaged in the proposal process. So they went to um, a, an anonymous, a dual anonymous peer review proposal process where uh, uh, proposals were anonymized and so nobody knew who it was that it was actually proposing for time. And after um, three years of this dual anonymous uh, proposal process, it turned out that women um, started to get more than 50% time on the Hubble Space Telescope, where previously they were getting only a quarter of the time, which is um, disproportionate to their population in the field of astronomy. So the Hubble Space Telescope uh, proposal process really helped us understand some of the gender biases that we have in our field. Um, and we are now adopting dual anonymous peer review for a lot of our funding and our observing time. Um, but the point of this this plot here is that if you are in Chile, if you are a Chilean uh, astronomer, you are guaranteed 10% time on the telescopes in your country, whether they're built by the National Science Foundation or whether they're built by the European Space Agency as well. And so that makes Chile, the Chilean government really want to invest in that infrastructure to support the Chilean uh, 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 STEM workforce, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics workforce. They're putting a lot of money into um, K-12 STEM education and supporting students who want to become engineers, computer scientists, data analysts, instrument makers, uh, lens makers, mirror cleaners, all the things that you need to uh, operate a world-class multi-billion dollar uh, telescope in a lot of cases. Um, so after Santiago, we flew to La Serena, which is um, unfortunately uh, my my notes on this are on the other file, so you'll have to bear with me as I go a little bit from my head. But Ch La Serena is um, the the base camp for the Gemini telescopes at Cerro Tololo and Cerro Pachon. So I'll get to those slides in a minute. But um, La Serena is about 92 feet above sea level, um, really nice beaches, but not really where you want to be if you want to do some astronomy, you want to get up into the mountains. So we um, took the um, the Star Trail uh, Highway and uh, made our way uh, to first Alpha Aldea, which is a winery and slash observatory. Um, and they have actually joined up uh, with many, many other wineries in the region for astrotourism in order to uh, kind of kill two birds with one stone, if you're into that sort of thing. They have uh, portable planetariums and telescopes and all sorts of good things uh, that you can see after this 
the sun goes down, but in, in, uh, before that happens, they'll treat you to a wonderful multi-course meal paired with wines and beers and other local uh, food and drink. And that was just really wonderful to get that kind of a treatment and then be able to take out the telescopes and do some observing. This is the view from Alpha Adeo of Sarah Pachon. So on the um, far right-hand side, you see the shell of the large sidereal synoptic telescope, LSST, which is now the Vera Rubin telescope. This hadn't yet, this was 2018 when I was there. So a lot of it, um, it was only partially built. Um, the Gemini telescope um, is over, the Gemini South telescope is over in the middle. Gemini North, you may know, is at Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. So these are 10 meter telescopes, one in the Northern hemisphere, one in the Southern hemisphere, synced together in order to see both of our uh, skies. What elevation? This is at around um, 8,000 feet. Uh, so here's a beautiful picture of the uh, uh, Large Magellanic Cloud in our Milky Way galaxy taken by um, Tiffany Woolbrecht, one of our teammates. Um, for astrophotography, I um, checked out a, a DSLR camera and a tripod from Elvian's IT department because I figured might as well get some stuff for free before I actually invest in it. And um, spent some time actually at the hotel in La Serena just by the pool, getting some practice on long exposures and you know seeing if I could uh, get any star trails or have the Milky Way pop out at all. Um, so this was, and Tiffany had never really done any um, observing or any astrophotography like this either. So um, she and I had some fun kind of comparing our beginner um, pictures with each other. Uh, we also met up with a school there. Part of the public outreach of the um, ASAP program is to meet with school children. This was on their science day. I didn't speak any Spanish at all, uh, which I felt was a real disadvantage for me. So I really relied heavily on Yasmin and Tiffany uh, to help with some of the translations for these kids. This is a pretty rural school, so they weren't very fluent in English either. And even some of the teachers weren't very fluent in English. But um, a portable planetarium, solar observing, um, and other sorts of fun stuff. You know, science, I guess, is uh, needs no language, right? And there's uh, truly international. And so the kids were super excited. And we had um, um, uh, different things that we could exchange with them. I brought some Albion stickers and some other people brought other things that they had made from their schools um, to exchange with the students. And it was a really fun time. Uh, so I showed you the picture of Sarah. Pashan, and then if I stood on Sarah Pashan, I would look out at Sarah Tololo. So Sarah Tololo is about, again, about 7,900 feet, um, and there's probably 100 or so uh, telescopes um, all on this mountain top. We actually got to stay overnight in the um, astronomer observatory here, and this was the first night that we were really in the thick of astronomical observing. Um, it was beautiful, clear skies. It was cold dark and clear. It was the astronomer's dream. I stayed up all night and it had been a very long time since I'd stayed up all night looking at the stars. Uh, so here's that view. Um, um, I think it was Steve brought a drone. So he was able to, no, uh, of course, Sam, Samara brought the drone. Um, so she was able to take some of these beautiful bird's eye view images of the campus. This is the uh, cafeteria and dorms. Where we stayed, the cafeteria is open all night long, as um, as you know, astronomers kind of come and go depending on their shifts. Um, this is called the Mushroom Farm, um, where we see all sorts of a uh, big and small observatories. Uh, there are the Korean Space Agency has an observatory here. Um, there are some um, education and public outreach. A remote observatories here as well, where people like me at a small school can apply for time free to take images in the southern hemisphere. Uh, so some of those are all, are are mostly remote. Uh, the Koreans actually do have people there, and they have a small little dorm and kitchen um, attached to their observatory. But the um, the the showcase on Sarah Tololo is the Victor Blanco telescope. It's a four meter optical reflector, and it was the largest in the southern hemisphere until a very large telescope was built in 1998. Um, the Victor Blanco telescope was used to make the observations of the um, super bright supernova 
um, that were actually fainter than we expected and helped support the idea of an accelerating expansion in our universe, uh, which gave um, the team of um, Australian and American astronomers the Nobel Prize in 2011. Uh, the dark energy camera um, is meant to survey for dark energy. Um, it's got a five year survey. It's roughly halfway through or maybe three quarters of the way through trying to get a handle on what dark energy actually is and what it can tell us about the expansion of the universe, what it can tell us about our place in the universe and maybe even unravel some brand new fundamental physics that we're just really trying to understand. So this is um, a cross section of being inside the Victor Blanco there. Um, the dark energy camera is affixed to the, um, the uh, secondary uh, of the telescope and then people in the red there are circled. So you can kind of get a scale, um, a size scale there. But we took an elevator all the way up. The dark room, the warm room is at the bottom. Uh, that's a full computer controlled uh, warm room there with kitchen facilities, bathroom, I think even a small cot, small area where you can rest your head if you're up all night observing. Um, so this is one of the places where they actually do have people on site making observations rather than remote work. Uh, so this is where we camped out um, our first night there, uh, trying to take advantage of the sunset over La Serena. Um, so you can see people all kind of and th these are people who actually work at Sarah Tololo and us as well, us ambassadors as well. Um, and uh, uh, just a really, really beautiful, beautiful uh, view from, from the mountaintop there out across the ocean, watching for the green flash. And it was a nice clear night, so we got to see it. That was cool. Um, and again, trying to take some pictures. This is one of my pictures um, of um, the Milky Way. Uh, with the Victor Blanco on the right-hand side, you can actually see the reflection of the Milky Way um, in the, uh, the telescope dome itself, and the slit is open, and, and so you're actually seeing stars through that slit. I thought it was very creative telescope shot there, so I was pretty happy with myself. Um, those are dark lanes, the, dust, dis, the, the dark, dis, dark dust lanes in the disk of our galaxy. Remember in the Southern Hemisphere, that's where we can actually look pretty much unobstructed through Sagittarius into the center of our galaxy, where we see lots and lots of energetic things happening across all sorts of wavelengths. Over on the left-hand side, that's actually the um, towards the center of our galaxy. So you can see that it, the colors are a lot different from um, the, the band that's coming up um, through the sky. Uh, again, trying to get a little creative. This is a long exposure shot of the largest small Magellanic clouds. This is La Serena um, on the uh, in the middle of the picture there. So they are actually trying. They are fighting some light pollution coming up the mountain um, as well. Trying to get some controls um, in La Serena to try to keep those skies dark up at um, seventy nine hundred feet. Um, but I was like a kid in a candy store, seeing these wispy clouds up there that you know aren't really clouds, but they look like it. And um, just beautiful, uh, beautiful night skies. And of course, all of those are stars coming through on that long exposure shot. But this is Sam, um, Samara uh, Nagel. Um, she's an amateur astronomer based in Ohio. She runs the um, Addicted to Astronomy Facebook site. It's got over 100,000 um, uh, participants on it, amateur astronomers from all over the world um, that um, uh, interact with each other on Facebook and get guidance and and she and, and she makes uh, her she has her own observatory in her backyard down in Ohio and um, I follow her on Facebook and she's always upgrading it with some new camera or some new instrument or some new something or other but this is what she does um, so here's the beautiful picture um, over the uh, dorms um, at Sarah Tololo. So it turned out that um, the astronomers at Sarah Tololo up at the Victor Blanco got a little bit mad at us because we were walking around and we had our flashlights out and they said it was reflecting up into the slit and blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> at about two o'clock in the morning, we were like, okay, we're done up here. And we made our way back down to the dorms where many of us just stayed up all night. And I'll tell you, I stayed up all night. I, the Milky Way was so bright that I saw my shadow in the snow from the Milky Way. And that is something I will, and 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 my my dear colleague, Dave Seeley, when I came back and I told him, he's like, you did what? 
no, that's impossible. You, that can't be possible. I'm like, look, and I showed him this picture. He's like, oh, I guess it could be possible when it's so dark there, right? And the only thing is the glow from the center of the Milky Way galaxy is bright as a moon shining right on you and seeing your shadow in the snow. It was, it's something I will never, ever forget in my entire life. So the Milky Way arching across this picture and the largest small Magellanic clouds there close to the horizon, uh, a view I can never get tired of. Uh, yep, so I don't know if I have a, look at you, right? So uh, upper right hand is the cross. Um, and then over, I think to the left, upper left hand, I think that's the jewel box there, yeah. Yeah, the jewel box is the small little thing near the uh, coal center, right? It's about near the coal center. Ah, uh, okay. This is, is this is the coal center here? Yeah, it's on the side. Southern coal center right there. Yeah. 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 So just, be, I, I, and I was at a disadvantage, right? I, I certainly don't know the southern sky as, as well as I know the northern sky. I was a little bit discombobulated. Of course, shadows are in the wrong place, you know, and, and the constellations are upside down and backwards and and is you kind of have to register. It's it's something it's something else. It's something else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 We're around. So that's kind of how it's and that's the northern part. So it's not all right. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So um I'll, we can I can put this one back up when I answer questions because I just love it. It's just beautiful. <laughs> Well, so one of the things I will say that a lot of us missed out on on the um, on the mythology. Uh, we know that um, the people who lived um, in South America uh, prior to Western settlement had a really good knowledge, a deep knowledge of the sky, and they had their own mythologies um, associated with the clouds and the dust lanes and the different things that they saw in the night sky. And um, one of our um, comments back to the program was you need to integrate some of that traditional knowledge um, so that we can learn about that as well because it turns out that if you have a really good eye and I, I used to know where they were and I can't find them anymore but there's a story in here about a mother and baby emu um, in those dark dust lanes as they move across the sky looking for uh, uh, water or whatever it is um, and so I, I I can't remember where they are anymore but um, it's it's stories like that that I would love to bring back to my students and just know myself um, based on you know knowledge uh, from from people not from Western cultures uh, so uh, again going back um, to uh, Sarah Pashon uh, this Gemini South there in the middle, Vera Rubin on the right hand side, and then the SOAR telescope on the left hand side. SOAR is has is partially managed by Michigan State, uh, so the astronomers up at Michigan State have time on SOAR, um, and then the rest of these are um, telescopes available for um, uh, 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 astronomers to apply for. Uh, so the SOAR telescope, Southern uh, Observatory for Astronomical Research. Um, you can get a sense of um, its size here um, and how it's located. These big, beautiful professional observatories um, are really, really impressive to go into. Um, I believe what we're seeing on the left-hand side is detector arrays so that each of those little circles is its own CCD camera, and um, it's collecting the photons that then get um, uh, funneled into a system that allows uh, uh, observations of lots and lots of galaxies in the night sky. So you can focus in on and collect photons from very specific portions of the sky. Um, and then the computer on the back end shows how, um, puts all those photons together and gives us the beautiful images from all sky surveys. Uh, another picture here of Gemini South. Again, it's twin is up at, in Mauna Kea um, in, on the big island. 
uh, these pictures were taken by a previous cohort of ASAP ambassadors. That's a great design. Look through them. I don't build them. I don't know. <laughs> but of course, you know, adaptive optics was a real game changer um, when that was introduced in the uh, early 2000s, perfected, I guess, and, and really started to become into common use in the early 2000s. Um, and this is one way for uh, telescopes to account for any wobbling up in the sky due to atmospheric haze or any moisture up there. And so what it does, what adaptive optics does is it actually creates a laser as a false star and the telescope can focus on that laser point and use that as the calibration so that when it actually takes the photons in from actual stars, it can correct for any, um, but any, any waving of those photons as they come through the atmosphere. So these guide stars um, are used then these laser guide stars then are used to measure those atmospheric distortions and allow for that correction down at the camera and in the image. Uh, so our last stop was the Atacama Desert. Um, and uh, again, here's that picture, uh, picture of me on the left and also here on the right. And it turns out that the Atacama Desert is actually used quite often as a Mars analog site. And um, lots of people do experiments there to see how uh, life can survive under very extreme conditions, um, including um, high salinity conditions and also very, very dry conditions as, and cold as well as an analog from Mars. So again, on our map, you can see where we are. We're very close to the Bolivian border up there in the Atacama. And we spent um, a lot of time um, in uh, San Pedro de Atacama, the town. Um, as we were driving back from the Alma High site, we found um, one of these creatures, which is actually called a vicuña, and it's part of the llama family. They're a little bit rare, but there was quite a few of them that were bounding across the road, and so we stopped. Uh, probably a little too long because we almost missed our flight, uh, but they're just adorable, and their their fur is much, much softer and finer than llama fur. Um, and so a lot of the markets down at San Pedro de Atacama will have vicuña uh, blended fabric then that you can buy sweaters and that sort of thing. So here's um, the little sleepy town of San Pedro de Atacama, not a high rise to be seen, a uh, very dark, um, uh, a lot of adobe uh, built houses, not a lot of windows, lots and lots of astro tourism. Come to the dark skies. We've got telescopes. Come do this. Come do that. We actually went to a nature reserve where they were having a star party, um, and that was wonderful because um, there was lots of good wine and lots of nice dark skies and campfires and bonfires and being able to, and telescopes like you wouldn't believe all over the place. And again, look at, uh, just like a star party here, right? Looking through people's telescopes at the Southern skies and learning what they're, about the new things for me, the new Southern skies that I was, um, and then hearing stories from what it's like to live there and what it's like to go to school there and, and how they're just used to dark skies all the time. Um, uh, something completely, completely different from what I am used to. Uh, part of, so we went to uh, San Pedro de Atacama so that we could go up to Alma. Alma is the Atacama large millimeter submillimeter array. There's a low site and a high site and we actually had good weather. So we went up to the high site at 11,600 feet um, where we uh, got up close and personal with these telescopes. And we actually, um, I don't know if this picture is in here. I think it is. Um, I'll get that get to that in a minute, but we got up close and personal with um, these telescopes. So these are radio dishes uh, anywhere from one to four meters across. Um, it's a joint international um, collaboration with Europe, uh, Japan, and the United States. Um, and each one designs their radio dishes a little bit differently. So you know which one's from the US, which one's from Japan, which one's from Europe. But these um, telescopes, they're radio telescopes, so they move out on tracks and they can actually move out to um, mimic a 40 kilometer telescope. 
because of the ga light gathering power, radio emission gathering power that they have based on the sizes of their dishes. Um, so that was a really, really incredible experience to be able to go up there. Um, it's been fully operational from 2013. Uh, here you can see some of the statistics. Um, the low site is at um, 9,000 feet. That's where the operation control center is, uh, where the technicians um, live and work, uh, where the engineers, computer scientists, data analysts, observers um, are hanging out. And then there's a skeleton staff up at 16,000 feet, um, uh, which is the high site. And um, and they're up there monitoring uh, the equipment, monitoring the data, uh, downlinks, and all that sort of thing that happen um, when you're observing. And the good thing about radio telescopes, as you know, is that you can run them 24-7. Um, and so they are constantly scanning the sky and getting information um, uh, about our universe. Uh, the big breakthrough uh, Story uh, was the uh, HL Tari observation in 2014, a protoplanetary disk. You can just see the resolution there where you have the protostar in the center of the image and then the dust lanes uh, orbiting around that central star with the gaps already forming. We're starting to see protoplanetary um, object formation there as dust lanes are being cleared out due to gravitational forces and those little dust balls from um, stellar for, uh, planetary disk formation are getting bigger and bigger, eventually going to become a planetary system in probably 100,000 years or so. Uh, so these are the transporters. Um, so much like the transporter that moves the that used to move the space shuttle uh, uh, down uh, down down the highway at Kennedy Space Center, these things are designed to actually bring those telescope uh, dishes and antenna down from the high site to the low site where technicians can operate on them or work on them at uh, in an oxygen level that's that's uh, uh, physically possible. Um, and so we had a chance to um, these are German. Uh, transporters here. Again, remember the European Space Agency contributed funding um, to the ALMA site. Um, so these are German transporters, um, and that's our crew there on the left-hand side kind of watching um, everything uh, and uh, people for scale. So you can see, and there's they, they drive up very slowly. I can't, I, it takes like two days or something crazy like that to go up and then, or to, to go up and then come back down um, with the telescopes on top. Uh, the correlator um, is the world's uh, highest supercomputer. This is where all of the radio uh, data comes in from those radio dishes and gets, um, I can't even begin to tell you what happens at these teles at these computers here, but those are the statistics. It's the equivalent of the computing power of a million laptops, and they're processing 17 quadrillion operations per second running this 24 seven as these telescopes are bringing in astronomical radio data from our entire universe. So here's another beautiful image of these telescopes just hanging out there. And uh, here we are at the, at the high site. Uh, many of us, um, Many of us, uh, uh, again, that's me on the left and Tiffany, me and Steve and, and, and Kyle right there on the right hand side, we had oxygen tanks with us just to make sure we could be, you know, keep our head clear as we're up there. It's pretty cold and we were kept being um, uh, reminded safety, safety, safety. And then we got stuck in the snow and, and that was super fun because again, we had a flight to catch. And we 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 literally were running down. There was half of us were up at the high site, the other half was at the low site, and our leader was at the low site. And he was oh, we had to do we had to have physical checks before we could go up to the high site. We had to do some oxygen uh, breath tests for the medical staff to make sure that we would be okay at sixteen thousand feet. And one of our teammates didn't pass, so they had to stay at the low site, and then our leader stayed there with them. Right. While the rest of us went up there and he got very agitated because it's like, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? We're like, we're stuck. Our car is stuck. Everything is stuck. And um, uh, some of the crew, then the crew officers, you can see them over here on the right hand side. They came out of that computer center. We finally got radio contact with them. They came out um, and they pulled us out with the chains. So that was quite an adventure one I did not expect. Oh. 
right. Um, so again, I didn't have my, my updated laptop. My updated presentation is on my laptop. So I'm using an older one that I didn't have a chance to update, but I was there in 2018. So we know what happened in 2017, 2019, 2020, right? With like eclipses everywhere. So uh, Chile was getting really, really um, excited and anticipating these beautiful opportunities where the whole world was going to come visit them, right? And so that's where they were really ramping up their astro tourism and really hoping uh, for a lot of, lot of people to come um, to these places. I think one of them got, got clouded out, but I think there was some pretty good, good observing sites um, in different areas as well. Um, and then one of the, if I do give this talk again, I need to find out when the next eclipses are happening um, down in that area because they're very, very excited for the future of astronomy in Chile. As I said, um, the government is making astrotourism and investment in STEM part of their economic business plan, if you will, and they're funnel, they're they're putting money into STEM education, they're putting money into graduate education, they're putting money into keeping their workforce in Chile to support the astronomers. Um, now, I only showed you Sarah Tololo and Sarah Pashan, the U.S. sites. There's a whole other mountain range that has the European Space Agency telescopes on them, like the very large telescope and the extremely large telescope and the super large bajillion sized telescope, right? As the, the things that we're naming them um, that are all owned and operate, well, owned, um, operated by the European Space Agency. So and Japan is investing, Korea is investing, lots and lots of countries are investing their astronomical capabilities in Chile because of that beautiful location, that beautiful combination of dry, clear skies um, on the west coast of South America. So the LSST, um, again, this is an older picture. It is um, almost fully operational. Its engineers, um, its engineering camera saw first light a couple of years ago, and the telescope is expected to actually start collecting data in 2024. It's going to survey the night sky every three days for 10 years. Let me say that again. The telescope is going to survey the night sky every three days for 10 years. Where are these doors all going down? Huh. So that data is getting piped into the piped, <laughs> piped to the command center in La Serena and then Trans-Pacific cables to Tucson, Arizona, where the Vera Rubin LSST uh, headquarters are. Uh, so uh, Data analytics is going to be very, very, very big deal. They're still trying to figure out how they're going to deal with all this data coming in and how they're going to back it up, how they're going to store it, raw, processed, how are they going to make it available. Um, they're planning to do a lot of citizen science with this, you know, retired people, other people who are interested in just digging into this data and figuring out what's there. What Vera Rubin is going to be able to do for us is help us identify transients, right? So we'll be able to see more supernova. We'll be able to see more galactic mergers. We'll be able to see more exoplanets. We'll be able to see more uh, Kuiper Belt objects and more asteroids and more, more, more for 10 years. Um, so it's going to be a really, really powerful telescope. Um, they're working on science education plans at the college level where people like me with, with college students will be able to just go to the website, download some data, download an activity, and be able to integrate it into my classroom and into our classrooms, high school teachers as well, middle school teachers. Um, this is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for us to learn a lot about our universe for a very long time. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to just close uh, my talk and uh, it up to questions. Again, thank you so much for having me. I'm just delighted to be here in person with you all. And um, I, yeah, and thank you. I welcome your questions. What's the name of that web, the website you talked about on Facebook? It's something like Addicted to Astronomy or something like that. Yeah. Sure, Samara Nagel. That's what it was. Samara Nagel. Site like that. Yeah. Okay. So the last thing we'll do is we'll repeat the question. And unless if you want to do it or I'll do it, we'll repeat the question. Oh, the question was um, what was the name of that Facebook website I mentioned? Okay. And I'm happy to repeat questions. That's fine. I have two questions. One, uh, when you were at altitude there, was the oxygen in an observer preventing this? 
So the question was, when I was at altitude at 16,000 feet, was the oxygen in the oxygen tank good enough to prevent headaches? Yes. Uh, that said, we were only there for about an hour. We were not there very long. Yeah, it's tough at that altitude. Uh, my next question is, for regular people, not educators, who would like to tour facilities, are these, any of these offer public tours? So the other question was, um, if you don't go to these telescopes um, as a tour, um, can a, a visitor tour the observatories? That's basically your question. Um, and I think that answer is maybe. Uh, I think if you contact the Gemini headquarters, for example, La Serena ahead of time and say, hey, I'm an astronomer, um, what, 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 what kind of opportunities can I have? I think they could probably accommodate that. Um, they do do star night. They do do public observing there. Um, for example, for the solar eclipse, they were going to have a big giant star party and, and people were going to come up and, and star party, eclipse viewing party, and people are going to come up. So they do do public nights um, every once in a while, but you'd have to check the check, plan ahead, check ahead. An annular eclipse in October. And uh, when's the, we, that's our annular eclipse as well, isn't it? Yeah. Straight up, basically, right through Arizona, I think. Yeah. Chile. Yeah. 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 What's the population of Chile right Ooh, what's the population of Chile? Do I remember? Um, I don't remember. Um, but I'm sure you can Google it. Yeah. It's the total ball knowledge. <laughs> That's the goods. Yeah. Um, we're, we're young astronomers now. So what's this Oh, so what's the ratio of uh, female to male astronomers these days? Um, I think, well, I think we're, I think we are 50, 50 across the entire demographic. Um, but when you get to the top, you know, that peak of your career. Uh, so exa for example, female full professors in astronomy in the country were still about 20%. So not close to uh, population of Chile, 19.5 million. Okay, population of Chile, 19.5 million. Oh, okay, partial eclipse in October in Chile. Thank you so much. The questions online. Maybe most... Did I miss questions online? Oh. I don't know. Oh. And that's no, no questions here. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to check. Thank you so much. All righty. So um, another guy um, in 2015, um, Fernando Tomoran, who works with the ESO, uh, arranged the BOF uh, staff to have a tour of, of some of these places. And Brother Guy was on antibiotics, and he was the only one that failed the medical check and was unable to go to the top of the mountain. So we are going to be meeting. Our next meeting is Thursday, April 20th. We are going to be meeting in person, Macomb Community College, uh, room 208 in the E building. It is 208, isn't it? <laughs> e-building um we are not going to the red coat tavern tonight we're going to try something different uh angelo suggested let me find it there uh he suggested the coney island located on old woodward about a block south of maple which is 15 miles they're open until 2 a.m and can accommodate our larger group of people and it's actually closer than the red coat so we're going to try that tonight and with that we thank you for my time is the oh, red coat tavern. not the red coat tavern it is the coney island on old woodward about a block south of maple which is 15 mile road i don't know the name of it
Who did, were you at Macomb? We went to the uh, uh um, Rosa Coney mm -hmm. yep. there. Yep. All right, and with that, we're closing the meeting. Good night, everyone. Yeah, and immediately closing that. Like, just stand there. Good job. Okay.